Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for having me. Thank you, Leslie and Omar, um, and for all of you. I let me start by. So my talk today, um, and or my lecture, is titled For the Disappeared. And here I want to front end um, some of the questions that my scholarship and practice uh, con considers and centers. What would it take to make an offering to the disappeared? How do we retrieve those who have been purposely erased from history? And how do we convene in the midst and aftermaths of erasure, elimination, expulsion, and mass violence. My historical work or my research or scholarship um, in, or, in part of my practice is to consider the social histories and life worlds of Palestinians after um, as Leslie mentioned, the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, when um, the majority of Palestinians, nearly 800,000 and more, were expelled from their villages and homes and towns and cities throughout Palestine and scattered all across the countrysides um, and the um, surrounding uh, states of Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, um, and, and further afield. These Palestinians whose lives were destroyed, their life worlds disemboweled, their communities erased, their very identities disappeared, continued to live on, or at least their survivors did. How do you write a social history after mass violence and expulsion and elimination? I make it harder for myself by thinking about children and writing a history of how Palestinian children and young people, students and their teachers and their parents and those who were instructed to educate them experienced that expulsion and its aftermath. I focus on the first decade and or so of, uh, um, of the experience of Palestinians after the Nakba from 1948 until 1967, and in particular amongst the majority of Palestinians in, um, who, who, were in, who ended up in the West Bank and Jordan. And I think about schooling for several reasons, because it was by and large the, the, most, um, the most widely experienced um, institution for Palestinians during this period, particularly young Palestinians. And it was a site through which their erasure was continued and the attempt at elimination was remained an ongoing process. These young children put their heads on a pillow on May 14th, 1948, thinking they belonged to a country in a place called Palestine. They woke up the next morning, whether they <laughs> left their homes or not, being told by everyone around them that not only does their country no longer exist, but their identity and their sense of self is completely erased. In that aftermath, this educational system that was developed by international organizations in coordination with host states attempted to further and expand this erasure. What I attempt to do is write a history of that disappearance, the continued attempt to erase Palestinians from history and memory and retrieve the possibilities for writing different kinds of pedagogy, the, the, the different pedagogical words, worlds that Palestinians developed for themselves despite this erasure. These images that I'm showing you are in fact um, collected from the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, which was the primary agency that was tasked for supporting um, and providing temporary relief, but now temporary has become 73 years, but relief for Palestinians. Um, and they were often for me, important tools by which I could build and convene um, conversations with Palestinian elders and, and their children and their descendants and the descendants of some of the figures in these photographs. This image, for example, was a particularly lucky one for me because I was able to find the young boy 
um, looking down at, his, at a textbook. And he told me the story of this wonderful picture. It turns out that as an UNRWA photographer was going from, town, from um, refugee camp to refugee camp, taking fundraising photographs during uh, fundraising photographs um, and uh, other assorted uh, sort of press, press material, um, he, he um, quickly entered this house as these young kids were sitting around their family table uh, trying to learn their lessons. The older girl, and I think on our left, was actually his older sister who was role playing as a teacher at that time. And her younger sister refused to play along. The only answer to that is go to the corner. Um, this apparently, this scene lasted a couple of seconds before all, all hell broke loose. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, the shenanigans began again. But the most, uh, but what I'm also interested in these images and archives and in this kind of historical research is less how the international world and how um, uh, states and regimes and parties and ideologies saw and attempted to control and confine and narrow the possibilities for Palestinian young people, but also to write about, about their everyday experience. I, in this image, I think it uh, exem exemplifies what I aim to do, by which I mean, just as we are looking and we, are, uh, we think we know these refugee children and these Palestinians, they are looking squarely back at us with curiosity, suspicion, melancholy, concern, and confusion. But the story of, but the story of that historical work and the kinds of research that I do around archival retrieval of social worlds has necessitated and, and develop, resulted in the development of thinking around what it means to ingather and to build socialities after that, after that destruction. And in that, I've developed slowly over the last couple of decades, a practice that is, um, it, that is ra wide ranging, um, that aims to constantly build spaces and attempts at convenings. And here I'm purposely utilizing terminology like cons convenings and conspirings and campaigning to front end the acts and the, the work that is required to ingather rather than the outputs. It's not that we gather in order to organize a conference or the kind of movement discourses around conferences and forums and discussions but rather what it takes to bring people together after such mass attempts at erasure and violence, fragmentation and dissolution. I don't know if you all recognize this image. It went viral about six years ago. It is the image of, so the story behind this image was that rumors spread wildly through, this is an image in Yarmouk refugee camp in, just outside Damascus, Syria. It is a refugee camp that was re re founded immediately after the 1948 war and is widely regarded by Palestinians as the capital of the diaspora. It is one of the largest refugee camps for Palestinians. And yet, and yet, it is one of those spaces of Palestinian sociali sociality and life that is so deeply underwritten. There is not a single social history of this refugee camp um, in Arabic or English. Why is one of the things that animates so much of my work and what it would be required to do that history and to write that history. And does this violence that we see in this picture mark an end and expiration date for the possibility of writing and developing a story of this incredible um, camp and its history. But let's talk a little bit more about this picture. One of the ways it was utilized, or the, the primary way it was utilized, utilized when it went viral, and, it, and by the way, it was also a photograph from, taken by an Ernawa photographer and is located in the Ernawa archives, was to signal the, um, the mass swell of violence um, as a result of the Syrian uprisings and the civil war. 
and the um, and the and the and the mass flight of Palestinians and Syrians from Syria as a result. This refugee camp's destruction became the image that amplified for many people the destruction of Syria writ large. And often people were told that these were in fact Palestinian refugees now twice, three times or four times disappeared and erased and expelled and uh, uh, their attempts, uh, attempts made at their elimination, but sort of lumped together as a mass of slightly swarthy looking Arab or Syrian uh, refugees desperate for help. Um, the story of this picture was that somebody in the camp heard something from somebody else saying that the Syrian government was going to lift the siege on the camp and allow a corridor for relief, um, uh, relief rations to enter into the camp itself. I've, that person told everyone else and suddenly all, the, all, the, all those who remained in the camp were out standing in a queue for uh, a bit of bread and a bit of uh, um, food. What I find curious is that if we think about this image a little bit more, it, tells, it can tell us potentially other stories that are rarely asked about this kind of imagery and about these kinds of archives. How, who are these people? What are their names? What are they saying to each other? Do they know each other? Who knows who? What are they talking about and conspiring? How are they organizing themselves in this, in this really um, quite remarkable queue? Um, who's, is anybody flirting with anyone else? They all look tired, but not all of them. They look like they're worried, they're concerned, but not all of them. So it's partly, partly the social scale that I attempt to do in my work is to ask some of the questions that are often left off the table because of this sort of idea of crisis and necessitating um, up only one particular gaze uh, in moments of crisis. But Palestine is not an exception. In the mid 19, in, in, in 1991, when I was a young child, when it, well, not that young, <laughs> um, when I was a tween, I watched with my family as bombs uh, flew and invade, uh, um, decimated the city of Baghdad in Iraq. This was the 1991 invasion of Iraq. When, um, See, it was the first time my family uh, had CNN and we were watching green bomb, like bombs falling at night that were lighting up the Baghdad sky in these kind of green fluorescence um, that marked US imperial power at its starkest. In the next 10 years, as I grew older and began university, I become, became deeply involved in an attempt to then um, um, end and overturn a sanctions regime that had further decimated and destroyed the, um, Iraq. This US um, regime of sanctions um, had killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and had resulted in uh, Iraq that by, by the 2003 invasion was only a, a husk of its former self. That work required me at a young age to begin to develop this, to begin to develop and um, gather some of the toolkits to think about and conceptualize what invasion looks like at a mass scale in ways that even I could not, had not but then begun to imagine and think about. What does slow erasure, what does forms of violence that, may, that are more structural look like for a population like the Iraqi people? And how am I, as someone who is complicit, meant to receive that information and what should I do about it? In 2004, um, I had by then become a doctoral student and was, fish hunt it was spending my time um, in refugee camps and in towns 
in Jordan and in the West Bank, looking for kids and their archives and, the, and photographs and images and all sorts of things to think about life after the Nakba for Palestinians. But in the aftermath of the 2003 invasion, uh, US invasion of Iraq, I found myself also watching as hundreds of thousands of Iraqis flowed, back, flowed into Amman as refugees, Amman being the capital of Jordan, right next to Iraq. So I put down that kind of work, that research work for a moment, and began to work for nearly three years with Iraqis and Palestinians on the border with, uh, between Jordan and Iraq in order to help facilitate and work around the bureaucracies, the narrow bureaucracies of international agencies that attempted to um, confine what these refugees, um, the future of these refugees, and to determine for them what next steps they may take. I'm being vague here on purpose. Um, during that time, I want to talk. I want to talk about this little this little object you see before you. It's a it's a very small, as you um, the size of my palm, um, um, verse from the Quran, the throne verse, Ayat al-Kursi, that was given to me by an Iraqi truck, truck driver as we were going back and forth between the Iraqi and Jordanian border, uh, facilitating doing some of that bureaucratic, uh, extra bureaucratic work. Um, and I was, and we came across a checkpoint just outside of the Ruwaysid refugee camp where Palestinian refugees were then um, residing. Some of them languishing, would languish for over seven years there uh, because the Jordanian state would not allow them to enter into um, to Amman and further into Jordan, nor to seek asylum elsewhere. Um, and, and, and I grew in, in, um, increasingly really nervous and I started shaking a bit. I was really young and I was a little bit, um, how shall we say, careless and, <laughs> and uh, didn't know what I was getting into sometimes with the kinds of work that I was doing amongst uh, in, in really um, sometimes dubious circumstances, very difficult circumstances. And he sort of turned to me and he pulled this out of his wallet while we're waiting there for our turn to be checked. And he said, carry this with you put it in your pocket and just recite it whenever you feel anxious. This is the only document I have as a result of three years of work on the borders of Jordan and Iraq. I have nothing else and it's for a reason. What would it mean under these conditions and in this political situation? What, I could never think that it would be ethical practical or possible to conduct oral histories with people who are in the midst of mass, uh, who are in the midst of a trauma that is undescribable and ongoing, nor to collect and gather in ways that could endanger them, endanger myself, endanger those who would conspire with me, nor to convene in ways that should be or ever recorded. This is in a sense, a document that tells me that, that, that gestures for me and for you, I hope, that there are worlds that are of where convenings happen that no document should or is ever um, found for. That does not mean that people don't actually convene. When I returned to write up, I also became involved and active in developing a mass multinational project in order to think about Palestinians and inspired in part for me by those Palestinians in the refugee camp who were never indexed within um, conversations on Palestinian um, exile or in Palestinian history. In fact, Palestinians and Iraq too are understudied and under historicized and they too, their, their social world too has now been almost completely erased and destroyed with very little documentation or writing apart from um, some memoirs and, uh, um, um, and, and articles. As part of this project that sought to you know, listen to and convene and assemble conversations amongst Palestinians all over the world in nearly 80 countries, um, we, uh, my task 
was to build an archival database of these communities and multiple social histories of the experiences that Palestinians faced in multiple sites from Yemen to Iraq. We did actually conduct some um, conversations and in convenings in Iraq, all over Europe, India, Latin America, the United States, um, and in uh, several um, countries and in North Africa and Southern Africa as well. In all of them, I sought to gather Palestinians together from different parts of the community and in different ages, in different spaces, um, back rooms, community centers, um, mosques and churches, um, university classrooms, anywhere I found them, fields, parks, picnics, and we talked together and learned about each other. And they learned about themselves, especially young people, when they heard their um, elders talk about what it took for them to arrive. And sometimes and often this was the first time these young people actually heard the history of the arrival of their arrival in, in that country. I want to sh share with you right now one such one, um, my conversation with Abu Marwan. Abu Marwan was one of the founding members of the Palestinian community in Vlardigan, Netherlands. Vlardigan is this um, sort of excerpt of Amsterdam where uh, there is a very, very large Palestinian community that has grown increasingly influential in local and national, well, local and regional politics. But more significantly, it is a community that ar arose from a, mi a chain migration of Palestinians into the Netherlands to, in, in order to work in one margarine factory. This factory used to have a branch in Nablus that ended up closing down and its workers brought to uh, the Netherlands in the 1950s and 1960s. Abu Marwan was the first person to arrive. So I'm going to show you right now a short video of the conversation I had with him. Um, it's in Arabic, but what I really, despite that, what I really want you to think about is the soundscape surrounding the kind of conversation that we're having. It was at the, um, it was in a commu Palestinian community center. There was a Depka troupe preparing to perform just outside of the frame, there was three conversations happening around us. And what happened was, is that in fact, talking to somebody else, when someone uh, approached me and said, hey, you know Abu Marwan is here, we would love for you to ask him how he got here because you know he never talks about it and maybe he'll, at, he'll, he'll tell you um, and we'd love to hear it. So there is also surrounding him as he speaks, all these people who began to gather around to hear the tale of his arrival and the story, the early story of Lardigan. Oops. Oh, sorry, something's wrong. <laughs> um, just one second. Maybe, okay, no, I don't want you to. I think I'm having a problem with the. You're not able to unshare? Yeah, let's see if this works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what to do. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Hmm. 
something's wrong. Is it freezing for you guys? Yes. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, one moment, please. <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. I mean, that, was, that was just a still from the video, right? Are you not supposed to it unshare was. this and then share the video separately? Here it is. Okay. Let's try this. Sorry about that, everybody. Nice little break. Anyway, so again, we're sitting, we're hanging out in a corner of a community center. People tell me, hey, come listen to Abu Marwan talk. And uh, I do. We have a lovely little chat. <laughs> وقمنا بأعمال كثيرة يعني في فلسطين وضحينا لأنه الضحي لا تسمع ونتعمل في العودة إلى فلسطين إن شاء الله لا دائما وكل وكل أولادنا إنه إحنا هنا دي زيارة يعني مش أكثر ولا أقل لكن طالت الزيارة يعني أنا عندي ولد يعني لما هان ولد هاي صار في عمد 42 عام وإحنا ننتظر أما في هذه المدة شرنا فلسطين أنا وإياه عدة مع Okay, so Abu Marwan was, you know, one of hundreds of people that I interviewed in this way alongside this, these, alongside others. But what I really want to point to here is that it is often in, in, in under these conditions that it is often these kinds of collective oral historical retrievers that end up being the most fruitful. That the kind of formalized structure that is often dictated by oral historical methods that individuate figures um, in their experience, that often interview them separately, often in quiet, cold rooms, with the technological micro, you know, this technology around them and surrounding them as they tell some of the most intimate experiences of their lives, um, can choke people's voices. But these kinds of socialities that are built where I end up developing, um, that I end up in fact listening more than asking, sitting back and allowing and creating space for them to craft their own stories in the ways that they would like, to end when they would like, to start when they would like, to watch as others intervene in the storytelling to, to um, ask for, for elaboration, correction, um, adding on their own experiences, all of those things are ways of protecting and crafting collective oral histories and um, convenings and convenings in order to develop these oral histories that keep people um, safe, that make them feel a little bit more secure under conditions where they feel uh, incredibly uh, that their stories are still fraught and still dangerous to be told. But of course, there are other formations that, and convenings that are about different kinds of political work and different kinds of conversations um, and gatherings. In 2010, 
I was involved in and, and was part of a collective, the US Palestinian Community Network, that aimed to intervene in the conversation amongst the broader social justice movements, uh, broader conversation amongst social justice movements in the US on Palestine. We were frustrated that after the 2008 invasion of Gaza, for example, so few social justice movements were willing to take on the question of Palestine in any sort of sustainable way. Why? What was going on amongst within them when we knew and understood that they were deeply themselves committed to an internationalist vision that thought and, and cared deeply about the question of Palestine and were in relationships with so many Palestinians across the United States um, in their own movement uh, spaces. This, con this convening, um, this is, so this is an image of the cover of the Palestine program. And this is the message that was uh, written collectively by the US Palestinian Community Network um, as the sort of front cover of that program. Um, this was a massive undertaking that, you know, dozens of assemblies and conversations and one-to-ones and uh, closed meetings in an attempt to figure out how we can think about contentious deliberate and contentious issues in a deliberative, generous and gener generative way. Um, we all experience different things at this forum, but I think the experience of attempting to convene it attempting to craft a space um, was in of itself, for me, a practice of figuring out, in fact, how to develop spatialities that are, um, that can facilitate um, these kinds of conversations. And by socialities, I mean the kind of chairs we had, the food we served, the spaces we took up, the air conditioning, the heating, the access issues, all of these kinds of very, very kind of embodied experiences of convening that are almost taken for granted or left off the table when we think about movement work and organizing spaces, but that are so important in the development of um, uh, uh, conversations that are uh, deep and sustainable and sustaining and affirming. This wasn't something that I learned though, only by doing activisty kind of movement work. It was also because as a young child, I was part of that intifada, the first intifada, that in the, by which I mean the 1987 to 1993 um, revolt by mostly, but not only Palestinian young people throughout Palestine against the Israeli occupation. I was a young child, I was, I was a kid, um, a, a 10, 11, 12 year old during that time. Um, but I didn't go to school. What I, where I learned from was in, you know, because schools were largely closed by the Israeli occupation. We were under month, often months long curfew, um, but we conspired and convened nonetheless. We were playing cat and mouth with soldiers across our neighborhood, um, in, in our neighborhoods. We were uh, meeting in back alleys, in orchards, in fields, under trees. Our teachers were trying to corral us to, in order to do our lesson plans. But often we went completely off script. Our, this is, for example, an image of uh, my history textbook, the Tarikh al-Arabi. And if you can see on the top, this is actually a textbook and most of the textbooks in the West Bank were censored by the Israeli occupation. Our teacher would start with the textbook, but by the time I was taking notes from the history lesson, I was taking notes of her rants against imperialism and colonialism and Israeli domination and settler colonialism that were not in that textbook. Um, she, she herself often took the opportunity and the freedom um, to not have to um, use the lesson planner and the curriculum and the textbook because she was no longer um, having to do so within a school that was likely surveilled by Israeli intelligence to teach us what she thought we should know. A 
but there was other things that I was learning at that time. This is also one of the few images that me or my family has of our years in Palestine during the first Intifada. I took this photograph from the window of my bedroom that overlooked the neighborhood courtyard where young Palestinian boys and girls would often gather to ready themselves um, to begin uh, to, 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 for a march uh, and to begin to burn tires and for a march and, read, uh, and march uh, towards checkpoints um, uh, in order to taunt Israeli soldiers and, uh, um, and, 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 uh, and protest. I don't know if you can see this image clearly, but on one end you see a young person, I think this is Assad, um, gathering rocks. Uh, on the other, you see a young man um, wearing the kufiya with a flag. That flag, in a few minutes, he'll run across the courtyard and crawl up the minaret to uh, place at the top, at the top of the minaret in order to <laughs> taunt the Israeli soldiers to gather, to, to barrel in with their jeeps into our neighborhood and begin to um, fire live bullets. I took, in fact, this photograph about 10 seconds before one of those live bullets um, flew over my head um, and lodged itself on the back wall of my bedroom. That's all I want to talk about though. What I want to talk about is the kinetic energy of this image and the kinetic energy of that moment in time where young people were developing forms of convenings that were um, that aimed to develop a unified leadership that would um, develop ways of, of de uh, deciding and determining their own future and an imagining and, and crafting an imagination of that future together. Um, one that rejected the hierarchies of elite bourgeois Palestinians and the, um, the forms of enablers, the enablers around them. These young people were thinking um, with, their, with their bodies and thinking, with, um, and thinking together about what kind of Palestine they wanted to have. Um, several, many, many years later, almost by accident, I become involved in a project that I think is, uh, is sort of challenged some of the ways in which I had been working in all these kind of multiple scales of convening practices and research. It was in fact, it really was by accident. So basically this, uh, um, a, a team of Norwegian artists um, were commissioned by Koro, the Norwegian Arts Council to, um, and, and won a commission to um, have a hot air balloon titled the Palestinian Embassy fly over the city of Liverpool during the Liverpool Biennale 2012. This was to be in coordination and in conversation with the Palestinian community, both in Liverpool and in London, as well as the Palestinian embassy itself that was in the height then of its move to declare statehood at the UN. A dubious endeavor as far as I'm concerned and, and that I thought was uh, quite dubious then. But what was interesting is that I had been contacted by the Palestinian community in Liverpool and invited to just come and see and check it out. So I took a train up to Liverpool and uh, to, train up to Liverpool to sort of check it out. And it started really lovely. This is, by the way, an image of a the, the sort of, uh, this is this is an image that was, uh, was, um, uh, made by the artists before the event happened. So this is kind of an advert for the, um, the performance of this uh, hot air balloon. Yeah, so it started with a bunch of Palestinian Liverpudlians with their adorable scout accents, um, making uh, you know, revolutionary fire speeches about the liberation and justice of Palestine, uh, the qu question uh, uh, of and freedom for Palestine, singing songs and their elders coming and like hugging them. And it was like a bit of a community affair. And it was, this is, this is sort of, um, and actually what, what happened was this young woman in the blue um, heard that I'm from this town of Tulkerem and told me, oh, you know, I'm from there too. And we bonded over that. It was adorable. 
And then John and Mike <laughs> started to blow hot air into the Palestinian embassy. I mean, this took a while because it was windy and it was like, you know, the it was really hard and the and the and the basket kept toppling over and it was a you know it was a bit of a it was a bit of a mess and yeah, it took a minute to do that, but finally, finally, the balloon, the Palestinian embassy rises, and by this time. Because of the, you know, the wonderful train services, the privatized train services that we have in the UK, the, those who were, who, who were kind of leading the project from the Palestinian embassy in London couldn't make it. So the leader of the Palestinian community in Liverpool turns to me and is like, we have decided that we would like you to take their place. What does that mean you say? Yours truly became the Palestinian ambassador of the newly inaugurated Palestinian hot air balloon embassy. And up we went. <laughs> um, you know, we bid adieu to the Palestinian community. Me and Michael were, you know, who is the head of the Oslo Ballooning Club, were, um, uh, <laughs> were you know, vibing and confiding and joining, in, joining me on that basket was a journalist from Freeze who was tasked to cover the opening of this new Palestinian embassy. And it was from his questions, in fact, that I began to feel a little bit um, uncertain about what I was doing and why I was there. It was the first time I've ever been in a hot air balloon. It was the last time I'll be in a hot air balloon. But it was, you know, while I was getting vertigo, I was also beginning to question what this project was actually trying to say. And did I agree with it? Or what did I think about it? All of that, of course, was interrupted. You know, and, and, I, I, and we were overlooking um, some of the old neighborhoods of Liverpool during, um, as we kind of, as the, the balloon was like wobbling. It doesn't show in these pictures, but it was really windy. Um, and a little bit, um, um, yeah, a little bit shaky of a balloon. So I'm thinking these thoughts, I'm having a bit of vertigo, I'm having this conversation with this freeze journalist that is asking me kind of random questions. We're all a little bit lost in this basket of this newly inaugurated Palestinian embassy. When Michael turns to me and says, oh shit, I, we're going to land in cow manure, in a field of cow manure. The Palestinian embassy um, was losing air and ended up falling into uh, uh, this field. I was, we toppled over, it wasn't too bad, but we ended up um, have stinking of cow shit and the balloons, uh, the balloon laid out, the Palestinian embassy laid out on its side, of course attracted a police helicopter, then the police, and then a bunch of kids who first mocked us, checked we were okay, then mocked us for days as we trundled off, uh, stinking, um, and heading over to Seal Street to um, drown our sorrows. The artists from Norway regarded this as a failed art project, a failed performance, a bit of a disappointment, a downer, um, not doing what they hoped it would do. I actually thought it was fabulous. It was a fabulous end to a project such as this. In 2018, uh, my, uh, I was commissioned by the Bahrain Pavilion at the 16th Venice Biennale alongside my collaborator, Sadia Shirazi, to uh, develop a scorebook um, as part of their Friday sermon, um, uh, Friday, Friday themed Friday sermon pavilion. We decided to do a, a scorebook for the people's Mike Kotba, by which we did, what, by which we meant and asked, what would it mean to score a chutbah, to cross a Friday sermon chutbah that is 
performed uh, by, you know, that is enacted every Friday across the Arab and Muslim world and cross it with the people's mic, by which we were asking, what would it mean if the sermon was given by the people themselves? We, you know, we developed the scorebook, we installed it, uh, and, in, in, and it was in Urdu and Arabic and Italian and English. Um, and it was installed in Venice. When we arrived to conduct enactments of the scorebook with those who worked in the back end of the Biennale who were anyway otherwise performing Friday prayers every Friday, we discovered that our project and the scorebooks had disappeared. That in fact, our installation was now gone and we couldn't, it was now gone. What do we do when our own work has been disappeared? When our attempt to ingather and convene people who are on the margins um, is erased? We thought we could, you know, we didn't, we decided not to issue a condemnation or decry this erasure and disappearance, but in fact to enact our own placements of the few scorebooks that I managed to hold on to um, in my, because of my attendance at the opening um, and place them in archival institution and archival, inst archival institutions and libraries. Um, for example, the British Library uh, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art as well as in community centers and mosques around the world. We place them on the shelves of mosques in Sarajevo, in, so in South Hall, in Edinburgh, and elsewhere. This was our attempt to refuse disappearance. So I'm going to end there. And I hope that uh, in the conversations we can think about and talk a little bit more about some of these convenings and projects.